Okay, hello and welcome to the History with Jackson podcast. Today, guys, we are joined by Caitlin Weldon, the active historian on Instagram, and we will be talking about female missionaries, Native American rights in 19th century America, Midwest. So hello, Caitlin. Hi, Jackson. Thank you for having me. Oh, no worries at all. I've been really excited to talk to you about your thesis and, and some of the topics within that. I think it's really exciting and I've, I've really enjoyed reading it, actually. So firstly, I just want to ask you, where did this interest come from? Okay, so I've always kind of had like an interest in the American West. Like growing up, my uh, my papa, my grandpa, I don't know what y'all call your grandpa yeah. in the, the UK. So my papa... Um, he loved the West and like Westerns and like I was always reading like books and like movies and we'd talk about things like that. So that's kind of, I guess, where it really started. But then once I kind of really started learning and like loving history myself, it was just kind of one of those things where like I like gravitated to the West. Like I live in Oklahoma. So like I'm kind of out in the middle of the United States. So it's just kind of, we have a lot of the Western culture here and we have like the Cowboy Museum and it's just so much fun. So that's kind of where I got started. So you've just been surrounded by it, really? Yeah. Oh, cool. And you told us about that uh, that cowboy museum on Ollie's podcast, History Emporium Pals, yes. or <laughs> History Emporium Plus, depending on what he's doing nowadays. Um, so it was really interesting for you guys, like for you to tell us about that. And if you mm-hmm. guys are listening, when that comes out, when Ollie gets around to editing it, please listen to it because it we put a lot of work and time into that. So, it was so much fun too like yeah. I loved getting to talk to everybody so that was a, a blast yeah it was I, I, I just loved doing the podcast and chatting to you guys and especially doing something like this as well so set time for some people listening you know a lot of people particularly outside, outside of the United States don't necessarily touch upon uh, American history and I know it's part of our curriculum now where we look at westward expansion but what is the American Midwest or was the American Midwest as a concept? You know, where, where does that begin? So I think the West kind of as a concept, it really was ever changing. So like, if you look at a map of the United States, like all of like the original colonization took place like on the East coast. Right. Yeah. So as people started moving westward, that shifting boundary line of the West just kept moving progressively westward. So, um, really what the the story we're going to talk about today really takes place in like the late 19th century. So probably from 1880s, to we'll say to like 1890s, we'll just give it that good 10 year window. So like the whole, like the West had been, it wasn't closed quite yet, but it will be closed from like the 1890s to like the 1900s. So like the West is just, I guess the place like, open land, like mo- freedom of movement. And like, um, you had like all of the farmers and like all of the ways to make money and things like that out in the West. I want to touch on something that you just mentioned there as well. You say it's like the, the American West was closed or almost closed. Some of our listeners, you know, what, what does that mean? What does the idea of the West being closed or open mean? So Frederick Jackson Turner, he was like a famous historian in like the late 19th century. And he had this thesis. Well, we'll just call it Turner's thesis because that's what most people yeah. call it. And like, it's so funny. Like I actually, uh, we're just a, a bunny trail here, but Turner's thesis pops up everywhere. So I made it like a game almost when I started reading like the books for my thesis. It's like, when is Turner going to pop up and where? So I would circle Turner whenever he would show up in the books. Cause it's not a matter of if it's a matter of when Turner shows up, but he talks about the west closing because there were so many people located within so many miles of each other um because of the the census the census records so the west had closed because they're i guess it's like it's like a astronomical amount of land between these people but because i don't remember the exact number but it's this sort of like oh there's no land left like there's like 200 miles between us and like we don't have like free land anymore or like whatever, but um, that's kind of where that closing took place. Yeah, because people were moving westward and settling. There's no longer, Mm -hmm. oh, America is there. Does that make sense? Is that more of a, what it is? 
I, I would say that's okay yeah yeah okay yeah because I, I, I've touched a little bit on it in some of my studies and I found it really interesting but okay. you know that begins the midwest and you know what's what's happening what is the midwest like at that, that time because nowadays you think you know it's big open farms country music mm-hmm. and stuff like that uh big trucks but w- yeah. <laughs> what, at that point obviously you haven't got the the big trucks uh so what was the midwest like um it was really like there was homesteaders out in the west and um the homestead act was passed in 1862 by abraham lincoln during the civil war and this act basically said that people um, men and single women were actually allowed to do this too, which is kind of interesting. Um, were allowed to go out into the West and take out a homestead as long as they proved uh, proved up on the land. And prove up means like they would build a, a structure, like a house, like a tar paper shack or a Saudi. And Saudis were houses made out of like sod, like grass. Like you would cut the grass okay. and then make it into a house. Like I can, I can uh, send you like an image or something that you can like drop in the nose or something. They're really kind of cool looking. But um, these people would take out these like homesteads, improve the land, and then they started making towns around these homesteads. And then um, you had the Native Americans obviously living out in the West still, and then some of them had put been put on res- re- some of them had been put on <laughs> reservations at that point. But um, some people, some of them were still actually roaming um, nomadic nomadically if that's a word yeah (laughs) we're just gonna make up words here but um the government was trying the u.s government was trying to i don't want to use the word i guess round up maybe like i mean if it's the right word i think it is (laughs) (laughs) yeah um but put them on reservations to free up land for um white settlers and expansion even though like these lands have been given to the native Americans, um, some of them in perpetuity, which meaning, which means like the land had been given to them forever via these treaties, but the government was breaking these treaties like left and right all the time. So like, that's kind of what was happening in the West at this point. Well, yeah, obviously today we're probably more, slightly more aware of uh, what was going on. You mentioned the lands there. I, I always find that quite interesting is that you know these lands were given to them you know forever Mm -hmm. like you just mentioned but then the wet the land these settlers were settling on yeah they were acquiring that um from the u.s government in quite difficult circumstances with the natives um so can you can you tell us some more about you know this native american land and how these settlers were acquiring this land so I want to go ahead and make it clear that I guess all of the land in the United States is originally native land. So like at one point or another, it is, it it is all native land and it was being stolen. So like, that's kind of like the U S government was making like corrupt treaties and bargains. Like they would make these like documents. And so the, the language was not always clear and um, they would coerce these native peoples into signing these agreements, whether they understood them or not. So this is kind of what's been taking place. And um, the missionaries and the activists that we're going to talk about today um, decided they didn't like this and that they wanted to help the Native Americans and they wanted to interpret the treaty documents and make it more fair for um, Native Americans to not be swindled out of their land and out of their um, resources. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. That's, it's, it's really clear and it's, it really does show that you know something that we're starting to draw upon and understand that how poorly these native americans were treated by the u.s government Uh, Mm -hmm. and earlier you mentioned the reservation uh system uh and everything coming out of canada as well at the moment is very difficult um and we're trying to reckon with that past but these reservations that they were put on uh or coerced into going to uh, what 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 were they like? Were they original tribe lands or were they just bad land that they were forced onto so the settlers could have everything that was, was good? So I'm going to qualify that the reservations were like, 
so they're all tribal like they're all tribal land because like i said before like all yeah. land in the united states was tribal land but they were taking uh tribes from certain areas and moving them to reservations in other tribes lands because native americans in the united states they're not all one group like there are hundreds of different tribes and they have like differing languages differing customs differing like religious beliefs and so they were moving one tribe into another tribe's land does that make sense yes and this caused conflict like between certain tribes and then this caused the conflicts between the settlers and like all of the conflicts in the west was that was that move to create that con like the conflict that you're talking about was that was that deliberate on the u.s government's part were they deliberately trying to create these conflicts between tribes i don't think so like i don't think the the they were deliberately trying to create conflict between tribes i think it just it just it happened because the united states government didn't take the time nor did they care to learn about the tribes and like the conflicts and like how this would affect um the greater population okay and then something that i found really fascinating within your paper was something called a an indian ring that was about the the u.s government policies and within congress i think it was so mm -hmm. what 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 was this indian ring you know who was part of it uh, and what were they trying to do so the indian ring was in washington dc and it was a bunch of like politicians and people with money and they were basically trying to take advantage of the native american people and the activists that we're going to like to talk about later and the organizations they didn't like this so they wanted to actually help help the native americans because they thought they were doing good things but they weren't always doing good things because they had i believe deep down they probably had good intentions like the the indian rights organizations but ultimately they all had assimilationist agendas and they just had different ways of going about them so and and some of these these people trying to help the native americans uh you've mentioned uh the native american association so on what were some of these groups um and you know they've, you've said they're trying to help them with assimilation but who were these groups and who were some of these people so i really talk about a handful i only talk about a handful of the organizations in my paper so like there are more organizations than what we're going to talk about here i just want to make that clear yeah yeah but the indian rights organization we'll just call them the ira because that's a mouthful yeah and then you have the wnia which is the women's national indian association which is like the sister organization to the ira because the ira wasn't supposed to let female members into their their group so they would go join the wnia and then you have the Lake Mohonk Conference and then the National Indian Defense Association, which is called NIDA. So like each of these organizations all had like assimilationist um, agendas, but they went about it differently. And that's okay. kind of what we're going to discuss. Now, also just a caveat, that IRA is nothing like the IRA in Ireland that, you know, the British are more aware of. So it's, there's no relation there whatsoever. No. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good thing to point yeah. out. Because <laughs> I was reading through your paper going, oh, oh, that's a bit, oh, wait, no, it's something different. So, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah it's part of your, your culture and what you're aware of. But I, I found it quite interesting how these acronyms pop up because they're quite easy to, uh, you know, Just to pick off. out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but one of these people that you, you talk about in your paper mm -hmm. and she's fa absolutely fascinating and she's part of one of these organizations is is caroline weldon um yes. so you know of course that's most the the subject of your paper uh mm -hmm. but who was she and uh you know what was her life like okay i guess i'll just make it clear here that caroline weldon and myself my name is caitlin weldon we're not related in any way shape or form because that's like one of the first things people ask me like oh y'all are related it's like no we're not but it's just kind of it just kind of worked out how it is but um okay so <laughs> caroline <laughs> i'm sorry <laughs> no, no don't be sorry at all it's really interesting i'm looking for i actually drove past the um weldon in northamptonshire the other day 
really which, which you mentioned in your paper yes yeah, so okay so it's northamptonshire yeah yeah so it's in okay, northampton like, i would have yeah. been pronouncing it northamptonshire i'm like yeah. i hope i don't say this <laughs> wrong so okay that's good to know but um caroline weldon she moved to the united states in the mid 19th century she's originally from switzerland like she was born there her parents um were pretty wealthy in the so I guess basically what happened is uh, Caroline's mother and her father basically go through a pretty nasty divorce because Caroline's mother had a affair with one of her father's friends from the military and it got pretty ugly. So the um, his name was Carl, Carl Heinrich Valentini and he went and moved to Brooklyn, New York because I assume that he was just trying to outrun the scandal that was attached to his name at this point. So after the divorce was finalized, Caroline's mother, her name, um, we'll just call her Caroline's mother because she's got a yeah. long name too. Um, she uh, took Caroline and moved to Brooklyn and left her other two children to live with her ex-husband. So Caroline, um, her name was Susanna Caroline of Fache in Switzerland. So when she moves to the United States, her name becomes Americanized to Caroline. So Caroline and her mother and her st her stepfather, because her mother and him get married, live in Brooklyn, New York. And um, she, I guess she would just, you say she had a normal childhood um, in Brooklyn. And then she eventually goes back to Switzerland to finish her education um, with her cousins. And then she um, visits with her father as well. And then she comes back to the United States towards the end of 1865. So like just as like the Civil War is kind of wrapping up in the United States and like Reconstruction is like um, becoming a thing, um, she's in Brooklyn and her stepfather, um, Caroline is very like much an art much very much an artistic person. So uh, her stepfather didn't like this at all. He thought she needed to be at home and you know, um, I guess like take care of the family, uh, clean the house, kind of very um, outdated things. But um, he decided he needed to get her married, like ASAP. And lucky for him, Claudius Bernard Slaughter, who was a fellow Prussian, actually moved to Brooklyn because um, some contacts had actually told him to meet up with um, Caroline's stepfather. So he actually opens up a practice um, for medicine down the road from the Valentini home and uh, he spends a lot of time there and um, gets to know Caroline and her, her stepfather. And he eventually asked to marry Caroline and her stepfather is just like thrilled. Like he's like, great, like you should marry this guy. Like he is perfect for you. Was she thrilled? So, oh, absolutely not. <laughs> she, she, well, let me put it this way. I don't think she was thrilled. I don't think she really, I don't think she really liked him but I'd have no sources that can confirm this to be honest. But um, they wound up getting married anyway, and her family was thrilled, of course. But they stayed in Brooklyn, and that way Claudius could, uh, Claudius Bernard Slaughter could continue his practice. And I would say they probably had a very tense marriage because um, it just, I just don't think there was like a lot of like, they had conflicting interests. Like he was always working, and like she had like the artistic like notions. And eventually, Caroline actually has an affair with a man named Christopher J. Stevenson. And I don't remember how long this affair took, like how long it took place, but eventually she winds up becoming pregnant. And her lover is like, no, like we're done here. Like I'm actually married. I didn't tell you this, but like her lover was married. And he's like, I'm going back home to my wife and I already have kids at home. So Caroline is left pregnant and she, could, she I guess she tried to go back home to her husband but he told her no and she had to actually like move back in with her parents and um she has the child and then her husband um uh, files for a divorce and one of the interesting things about this case and I guess it's also I was maybe interesting is not the right word like tragic things honestly is like he attaches a chilling coda to the end of the divorce papers saying that Caroline cannot actually remarry anyone unless he is actually dead. So like she can't remarry until he is dead. And he actually remarried relatively soon to a widow 
whose husband actually had a practice, another medicine practice, which was, I guess, bigger than his. So he took over the other practice and Caroline is stuck. Um, I, I think she was living in like a Greenwich Village neighborhood or something yeah. at this point. And she was working in a beatery, um, supporting her son, supporting herself. Um, what's interesting is her son is actually never mentioned in any of like the, um, the, the census records. So I don't know why. Like I have my suspicions about why he's never mentioned in the census records, but he doesn't pop up until uh, she gets to Dakota Territory, honestly, is when you first finally start seeing uh, records of him. So. Okay. And then what happened, what happened to her son? So I guess he's just like, I, maybe she sent him to like a school or something at this point. I'm not really sure. Like there really are no like published records, but um yeah there's really no published record yeah. so we don't really okay. know what he was doing there like we'll talk about what happened to him um in Dota Dakota territory later i feel like that that goes better in the story uh, okay yeah in completely. a few minutes are, <laughs> otherwise we're gonna get out expert. of out of a uh, timeline here so so she moves she moves westwards to dakota territory mm-hmm. um but you know obviously she's moving there for a reason uh, mm-hmm. what what got her interested in helping if that's the right word uh the native americans so i think that she probably so she couldn't move to the west until she uh, had a strong sense of like familial duty and like her stepfather passes away eventually so she has to take care of her elderly mother because she's the only person in new york in the in the united states to, to take care of her mother so I think that while she was taking care of her mother and raising her son, that she probably started studying um, the Native American rights organizations through like the newspaper. And then Brooklyn was kind of a, a more, I guess, of a for your thought kind of, or for your thinking kind of neighborhood. And I think that she was probably having conversations with neighbors and people that she worked with kind of about what was going on in the United States at this time. And um I think that that probably inspired her move westward because she was like hearing about the IRA, the WNIA, and IDA and all these different things and how the the different conflicts with the Native Americans were affecting um, or how the military conflicts were affecting the Native American settlers or Native Americans and the settlers at that point. And uh, she eventually um, starts writing to Dr. Thomas Bland, who was the head of NIDA. And then I also want to make note that his wife, uh, Dr. Cora Bland, was also very well involved in that um, she, uh, this was kind of, I guess, unusual to have like a woman that high up in an organization that was, I guess, mainly comprised of men, but um, both doctor, both of them were doctors Bland. So um, she started to write to Dr. Bland and he had asked her to go to Washington in 1888 to meet with a delegation of Sioux chiefs, but she was ill and she couldn't go, but she continued riding with many of these uh, Sioux chiefs and um, sending them like land price lists and like the different things that the government was not telling them concerning the uh, the Dawes allotment act. And then um, within the next couple of years about the Sioux bill, the Dawes Sioux bill. So okay, that was kind of her purpose for moving westward was to and you, explain you... things. You mentioned as well that some of these letters still survive. Mm -hmm. So how do they survive and uh, where are they now, if you want to look at them? So there is a book that's published by Stanley Vestal, and he has actually put her letters in this book. I think it's called New Sources on Indian History. Um, I'll send send that to you as well. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, yeah, definitely will. And then what's really cool is that Stanley Vestal was actually a pen name for a professor at the University of Oklahoma, OU, which is um, the rival school for my school, but that's okay. (laughs) But uh, (laughs) uh, they actually have a lot of his papers and his collections down here in Oklahoma, which is kind of cool. But I never got to see them because of the (laughs) pandemic. So that was unfortunate. Maybe one day though. You get to get in that word as well, that rival school. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) That's cool down south. <laughs> oh, don't blame you at all. Now, she was looking after her elderly mother. Um, and unfortunately, in 1887, 
a mother dies. So mm-hmm. she's left a divorce, divorced single mother living alone in New York. You know, what, what does she do? What does she, what does she try and do within her roles in the organizations? And, you know, what, you know, she's, she's stuck. She's lost. She's got no one except her son. So what does she do? So I want to make a note that she, her mother left her $2,000 in her will. And I actually converted that over to like today's money. I was curious. Oh, that's, and... that's the only question you ever get asked, isn't it? That's... So like in today's money, like what she got left by her mother was like $56,672.63, which is a lot of money, I would assume, for like a single divorced mother. So, um, but her role is within this organization um, at this time. Like she, I would assume she's packing her things, getting ready to go west. But um, she's con- like she's still writing letters with the chiefs because, like I said, she was supposed to go to Washington in 1888, but she couldn't go because she was ill. Um, I would assume she, after that, she kept conversing with doctors, Th- Doctor Thomas Bland, and the other Sioux chiefs, and she started writing to Sitting Bull out in Dakota Territory and she started packing her belongings and she would actually go out to Dakota territory for the first time in 1889. So between her mother passing away in 1887 and 1889, she had two years to kind of, I guess, really become aware of what, the, what was happening and then also prepare to take care of her son. Yeah. And she also reinvented herself. She didn't just move, yeah. she reinvented herself. So obviously you've gone through you know, what she was born as, the Americanization of a name. But at this point, she becomes Caroline Weldon. So, right. you know, what? why is she doing this? Why is she reinventing herself? So again, there are no like concrete, like race or concrete sources that tell me why she changed her name. So like, this is kind of just speculation. But I would assume that um, she changes her name because she, she needs to get rid of this past that's following her. You know, like she's got like the divorce and she's got um all of I guess just the scandal that surrounds that at this at this yeah. time period there's just so much scandal right there and then she's got a son out of um the the affair so like um, so a big no-no at that point really yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah so like she just like it was just bad for her like so I assume that she changes her name so she can throw off the, uh, the shackles of her scandalous past. Like she's freeing herself. She's moving West. She's going to reinvent herself. Like she um, takes on the identity of a widow, even though her ex-husband is still very much alive and living in Brooklyn with his new wife, but she presents herself as a widow and she changes her name to Caroline Weldon, like you said. And I've got like speculation, like we mentioned earlier, like, um, I assume she probably knows about the the Weldon. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? I guess lineage. In, yeah, stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, in uh, Northamptonshire. And um, she was educated. So, like, I make the guess that maybe, like, she saw, like, herself being, like, the city on the hill, uh, like, through NIDA. Like, maybe if they could stop. Um, stop the, the Sioux Bill on the reservations that they could like help the native americans like it's just, like their ideal is what i assume like okay but I, I don't know for sure but that's just kind of my assumption oh, that's very interesting and it's especially as she was an ed- educated woman to to mm-hmm. go over and do this on her own will off her own mm-hmm. back is very impressive um so you know american midwest she's a single mother widow now um mm-hmm. You know what? What? What's she? Yeah. What's she? What is she? What's she doing there? And you've mentioned Sitting Bull. Uh, what's mm-hmm. she doing out there in the Midwest? What's she doing with Sitting Bull? So, she hops on a train because that's like the the way you move um, through the the West at this point in time. So she takes a, a train to the West and she winds up in Dakota Territory, and um, she is going to the West to act as a secretary on behalf of Sitting Bull. And Sitting Bull allows her to do this. Like he understands that Nida and Weldon have agendas, but he sees her as an asset because of her education is what I assume. Cause like I said, there are really, there are no like written sources to confirming like this. So like a lot of this is just kind of speculation, but she's got the education and she knows how to explain things. 
and then Dr. Bland and all of the other NIDA members that are in DC are like, you know, they're like con conversing and like writing letters and things like that. And um, she's trying to show them um, what the, the Sioux bill will do to the reservations if they agree to what's going to happen if they or like if they don't like what will happen to them then but like um I guess we I guess I should explain what the Sioux bill is first I keep saying Sioux yeah bill. yeah so um the Sioux bill was passed in March of 1889 by Congress and it basically was going to take the Great Sioux Reservation and divide it up into six smaller reservations they wanted to take the excess land and sell it to settlers like it wasn't excess land it was land that belonged to the native americans but the the united states government and all the settlers saw the that that the native americans weren't using it for farming like they wanted them to so they decided that if they could shrink the reservations um they could take that land and um anglo settlers could use it for farming so uh, and does that kind of make sense yeah that make that, that makes a lot of sense and it's you know it's part of that as some people will consider it a genocidal practice to remove them. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Sitting Bull, he's the tribe leader of the Sioux, mm -hmm. if I'm right. Yeah. And how yeah, how important is he within that um that kind of decision to bring Weldon to Dakota? So I think Sitting Bull is very important. Let me put that there. He's like one of the, the head people, like very, very, very important, very important man. Um, I think, honestly, I've never been asked a question, that question quite like that before, but um, no. I think right. Nida, no, it's okay. Um, that's a really good question though. Uh, I think Nida was more instrumental in sending her out there because like I said, they all had their own agendas. And I think, that once she got out there, like she had been writing to Sitting Bull that he probably under, like, understood kind of, I guess, what she could do for him, if that makes sense. Yeah, well, he's like, got his own agenda as well, hasn't he? Yeah. So yeah, I, com I completely understand where he's coming from. <laughs> That's a really great way to like ask that question though. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, no. So I like to ask questions. And I like to know stuff and teach other yeah. people stuff. So here Absolutely. we are <laughs> so, so obviously she's she's working with sitting bull um mm -hmm. he he does speak a bit of english but is there that language barrier or she's speaking uh sioux tribe language so i think sitting bull could speak english pretty well honestly because he had traveled with um uh, buffalo bills wild west um and had toured so like and then he also, you know, like communicated with uh, the Indian agent, James McLaughlin. Yeah. But Weldon did pick up uh, pieces of the Dakota language. And um, she also found the books, um, Stephen Return Riggs and another man uh, were missionaries to the Dakotas um, several years earlier. And they had actually translated a lot of uh, uh, religious documents and other, um, I guess, educational documents like between the two languages. Yeah. So I think she probably like was studying those honestly too, but there was um, pieces of paper found in Sitting Bull's cabin in Weldon's handwriting um, of like words, like with translations. So like she was like keeping records of what she was learning as she went. So. That's really amazing to be honest that she's having, she's not only conversing with these, these Native Americans in English, but she's also making that effort not only to help them assimilate, but mm -hmm. to to actually assimilate herself, which I find really quite impressive, actually. But, you know, her learning this language, does that help her in helping them assimilate? So, I guess let's, um, she wanted them to assimilate. I don't think they necessarily yeah. wanted to assimilate. I just want to make that kind of clear that assimilation was really forced onto the Native peoples, like, often they weren't, I guess, really, I guess, given, I don't want to say they weren't given the choice, but it was, it was one of those things. It was a rock and a hard place where you either they, assimilate I, or you've got a worse condition. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good way to put it. So, 
No, I, yeah. I, I really, I really sympathise with them uh, because obviously it was, it was either be forced into horrible lands in a small amount of space or take part in a culture which isn't yours and watch yours get eradicated, which mm-hmm. is really quite painful to read. And you, and you express that really well in your um, your thesis. So yeah, I've 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 definitely sensed that pain throughout your so, life. I feel like the eradication like the the eradication is what the anglo settlers wanted but let's make it very clear that eradication did not happen because the native cultures are still very much here and thriving today so let's just make that clear (laughs) yeah 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 i don't yeah i don't definitely do not want to say that they're not there anymore because they are very much still alive um so 1890 uh Weldon has returned to Dakota. She's mm-hmm. she's watched the reservation system grow and and change, but she's returned after going back home. So what what changes in the year that she's away? So the Dawes suit bill actually passed. So that was the bill she was lobbying against in 1889. So the Crook Commission wound up coming through all of the the different um, tribes and getting, well, I say getting, coercing really um, Native Americans to sign the, the, the paperwork saying that they could divide the Great Sioux Reservation into the smaller reservations. So Weldon goes back to New York after all this because she couldn't stop it. And um, she returns back the next year and she finds that the, the Sioux were just in like terrible like um conditions like destitute like the rations had been cut to one fifth of what they what they had previously been so like they were starving they didn't have adequate clothing like it was it's cold up in dakota territory like it gets frigid and like they just didn't have enough like clothing and shelter and um walden would actually go through and actually buy supplies for um her native friends out of her own pocket so like there is like a record of her doing that yeah and like people did not like that so and that kind of you know going out and getting her uh, buying stuff for these uh these native americans shows her kind of maternalistic um approach to assimilation where you know in a pa- in your paper you very clearly outlined that she referred to them as you know my my native americans yeah, my, my my dakotas yeah so, you know, can you, can you enlighten us a little bit on that, that kind of approach? So I feel like that's kind of one of those things where um, I guess through like the different associations is not so much um, like if you're going to be assimilated, it's more like how they're going to assimilate okay. you. So I feel like that's one of those things where I think she just took that kind of um persona and pushed it on them like i'm going to take care of you but you're going to do what i say okay. that makes sense yeah. like, there's a a really good like article and then there's a good I, like i haven't read the full book yet but like the article is really good it's called um uh margaret what's her last name it's jacobs i think uh it was maternal colonialism so okay. and the idea of like using the mother the motherly figure to go in and um colonize people well that's that's obviously that's definitely an approach that some people are taking and it's it's quite interesting looking at the history of colonialism especially uh american colonialism and how they how they west or marched westward really mm-hmm. um now in this time the native americans were undergoing change in their culture um and their and their religious beliefs and the ghost dance swept mm-hmm. the native american community you know what was this and how 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 much of a change was it for for their culture so the ghost dance um i think it originated in the 1870s oh, like at first and then it kind of had a revive revitalization um in like the late um 1880s 18 or early 1890s and there was a paiute prophet Paiute prophet named Wavoka, and um, he was teaching this religion. And Kicking Bear 
and a couple of the other men from uh, the Standing Rock and the surrounding reservations went to go learn about this religion. And it was a peaceful religion. Um, talking about um, returning like Native Americans to like their rightful status as like the owners of the land. is how I understand it. And they would wear these special shirts called like, I think they're the ghost shirts or special shirts. And they were supposed to be like um, bulletproof and they had like special designs on them. And then they were like supposed to dance. And the white settlers, they did not like this at all. They thought that it was a war dance, which it was not. It was a very peaceful religion. We'll just make that very clear. The ghost dance is a peaceful religion. Um, and James McLaughlin, he wasn't super concerned, the Indian agent at Standing Rock. He just assumed that it would be one of those things that kind of ran its course and then went away. But he, he didn't like it. And the settlers around um, the Native Americans who were practicing this started moving away because it made them uneasy. Yeah. And then Caroline Weldon also didn't like the ghost dance because she saw it as undermining all of the work that she had done, you know, to like help the the Sioux. So And she and she really didn't like it from from what oh you've God. you've you've told me. So how how did she broach that subject? How did she talk to Sitting Bull about this religion? She basically just told them that she thought it was foolish and that um they were undoing all the work that she had done. I think, I think I read somewhere, I don't remember when, but um, that she actually like um, gave like a speech to like her Native American friends and like, um, I, I guess belittled maybe like belittled them and like told them like, this is like not something you should be doing. But this is also another one of those examples of where um, the missionaries and the activists going into cultures didn't necessarily want to understand the culture. They just wanted the culture to do what they wanted them to do, like assimilate. So. Yeah. It's, it's, it's quite interesting seeing uh, or watching uh, Carolyn Weldon go through that journey of, you know, softly trying to force them to assimilate to, you know, that, that, that impact. Yeah. That switch. And I found that switch really quite, scary really and i can imagine sitting bull probably found it quite scary just watching her switch like that um i don't know like maybe like i feel like most of like the anglo people that were dealing with the the native americans at this point though they were switching quite rapidly like that so i think it's probably just one of those things where he's like oh another one another one has switched yeah maybe so yeah it was probably fairly used to that process as well so one thing that came across to me was that i'm not sure if you you want to see it this way but i saw weldon was kind of a bit of a, a hypocrite in my in my interpretation mm-hmm. you know she's she's preaching about you know let's let's assimilate them let's give them some land let's work with them on this reservation system and yet she she built a, her own house so she got to build a house she wanted to build a house but she wasn't given permission to build a house so but i do like i i that's kind of how i wrote that piece kind of to yeah. appear that way it's like it's like oh it's like you just fought against this for like two years and now you just want to go build a house because the the bill you're arguing against says you can yeah you're you're, you're part of that you're part of <laughs> you're part <laughs> of the problem you're fighting against yeah so I found that, very, and I think that was very well written as well for me to catch what you were saying as well. So I, I really like that part, actually. Thank you. And then uh, I also want to, like, I guess say that she also asked, like, after she asked if she could build a house and James McLaughlin told her absolutely not, you know, like, James McLaughlin didn't like her. He didn't want her on his reservation or on, on the reservation. I will call it his, but. Um, I feel like asked, we've spoke about James McLaughlin as well a little. So who was James McLaughlin quickly? Okay, James McLaughlin was the Indian agent at Standing Rock. So he was like the Anglo man in charge over, like he was the government appointed person at Standing Rock, at okay. the head honcho, I guess. But um, she also asked him if she could teach at the day school, like the industrial schools. And he said, no, I don't, I don't need a teacher at my school. There are no openings. And she's like, well, I can open up a, a school out here. And he's like, no, I don't see a need to open a school out there because she wanted to teach the the women and the girls like domestic sciences and things along those lines 
so and she even went as far as to like ask dr bland to ask the indian commissioner like the head indian commissioner in dc if she could be a teacher and they're like no no you can't be a teacher so he really didn't like her then yeah (laughs) because there was another teacher uh Lucy Arnold, who was working with Nida on the Rosebud Reservation as a, a day school teacher. So I think he just really he just really didn't like Weldon is what it was. Yeah, and she's she's right and obviously we spoke we touched upon this earlier. It's like she's she's writing letters throughout this period to mm-hmm. Sitting Bull, McLaughlin, uh Doctor or the Doctors, both of them in DC. So through her writing, what can we what 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 can we see Weldon talking about um she talks a lot about um just like i guess daily activities and then also like she talks about the different like political things happening through nida yeah and and obviously we're we're talking about this overarching political narrative we're talking about the the social narrative that's going on with the native americans and we're going uh we're looking at what Caitlin, well, not, not, not you, sorry, Caroline Weldon uh, was doing with these Native Americans. But what, what was a typical day like? Um, that's another great question. I've never been asked that one before either. <laughs> um, I would assume that she probably, it was. Uh, she probably wasn't with them all the time. That's why I was. No, I don't think so. Like she was there only for like certain like so many months of the year okay. like the first time she was there for like two months three months maybe she don't know and then, asked that either but then she went to back to new york and then she returned to dakota territory and then and she left dakota territory again is she so. living with her son at this point just to touch back in on that point yes i think he went the second trip for sure i don't i can't confirm that he was with her on that first trip like Maybe he was, maybe he was. I can't confirm that, but she, he was with her on the second trip for sure. Okay. Because it's, it's really quite interesting to see that, um, you know, she's, she's living in Dakota for these small amount of times. She's got us, you know, she's a single mother. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's quite interesting to see, like, to kind of see all this stuff about her, but to not hear anything about him. I found that. See, I really, I wish there was more written about him, but there's nothing. Like, honestly, like, I would have loved to have learned her son's name is Christy by the way Uh, we keep calling her son her son's name is Christy and we were talking about Weldon actually leaving Dakota territory so like her and Christy were actually going to visit her nephew in Kansas City because he and his wife were living there at that point and Christy actually stepped on a rusty nail um, before they boarded the uh, steamship the Abner O'Neill to head south down to Kansas City And while they were on the ship, unfortunately, lockjaw, um, which other people call it tetanus, um, set in and Christy suffered an agonizing death and he died aboard the steamship. And Weldon was distraught with grief. I mean, rightly so. Like her only like connection, I guess, left in this world had just passed away. And then they buried Christy once they got to Kansas City. So... Yeah, he that's really rude. didn't. I think he was like 14 at the time, 13 or 14. So he died very, very young. So like there really are like no paper like trails left. Or like well, that's really sad because that's a whole world like you just said. Mm-hmm. And that probably feeds into that maternal instinct that she has over, you know, her mm-hmm. her Native Americans. Mm-hmm. And it's uh, reading there, I, I definitely sense the the sadness that she felt over that and she Um, was like writing letters to sitting bull still at this point she um was telling him about christy's death because sitting bull and christy had interacted so she's like christy died and then like she's still like in the same letter telling them you know like i wish you would stop the ghost dance like don't ruin what i did you know like all these things so and obviously she's telling quite personal information there to sitting bull you know she's (laughs) she's talking about the death of her son and if it was just for a political game, she might not be be saying that. So what was her relationship like with Sitting Bull? So really what we know about her relationship with Sitting Bull is what we know through um, the papers that were left in Sitting Bull's cabin that were found in like the, the drawers. And then 
there have also been like sensationalized accounts in the newspapers, but you have to take those kind of, I guess, with a grain of salt. Yeah. Because they were, they were trying to create a, a picture of like a not good picture of Weldon at this point. But um, like I said, Weldon acted as Sitting Bull's secretary and advisor, but he also at one point um, proposed marriage to her because in the culture, you know, you, they were to take in like widows and like um, take care of the families and things. So he uh, proposed marriage to her and Weldon was livid. Like she was so angry because she, she saw herself, um, I, I guess as a partner, like uh, they, were, they were just working together. Like there was nothing else there. And like Sitting Bull didn't know, like, he's like, well, this is what we do here. Cause like, there's a piece of paper in the desk. Um, and it, it says, don't tell me about Chaska or you had no right to tell me about Chaska or something along those lines. And that kind of like implied like the, the um, that he had proposed marriage to her because um, there was another couple um, it was like it was like an interracial like marriage kind of thing is what it was like implying and she was just mad about that but that's another conversation for another day yeah well so. i think it's very interesting that in that time he felt as it was acceptable and he felt that kind of responsibility towards her mm-hmm. which she perhaps felt a different kind of responsibility but it's very interesting to see those dynamics play out and of course she's left she's left the kansas city and she's she's left Sitting Bull. Now, what happens to to Sitting Bull afterwards? So Sitting Bull um, was making plans to visit another one of the reservations close by, and James McLaughlin, um, if we haven't made clear already, does not like Sitting Bull. Like he just he does not like him. Like they they butt heads, but. Um, McLaughlin gets word that Sitting Bull is trying to leave the reservation and he sends in his Indian police, McLaughlin's Indian police, to arrest Sitting Bull. And Sitting Bull was going to go peacefully, but then somehow um, his one of the wives starts wailing to alert the other ghost dancers in the camp and they uh, surround the cabin. And a scuffle ensues and Sitting Bull is shot and several more shots are fired and Sitting Bull is murdered. So um, that's when they went through the, his cabin and they found a lot of the, the writings in Weldon's, uh, Weldon's handwriting. And then they also found the portraits that Weldon had painting painted of Sitting Bull. So there are two surviving portraits that Weldon actually painted of Sitting Bull and one of them's in North Dakota at one of the museums up there. I think the other one's in Arkansas. And so. obviously that that's a great leader of that tribe gone. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, a few, I think it's a few years, maybe a year, a few months later, you have the Battle of Wounded Knee uh, or the Wounded Knee Massacre, if you call it. So um, I wouldn't call it a battle. I call yeah. it a massacre. <laughs> so what so, what happens there? So it was uh, a month later. Honestly, it was just it was just uh, uh, maybe not even quite a month, but several of the followers of uh, the Sioux had uh, camped at Wounded Knee, and the U.S. Army had surrounded them, and they were trying to um, take away the guns. And again, uh, a shot was fired, and the US Army just rained down bullets on these like Native American people and just killed indiscriminately like women, children, elderly people. Um, anywhere from 250 to 300 people were killed, like murdered, like in cold blood. And they buried them. Um, like, I think it was two or three days later after a snowstorm and like just mass graves. And it was just a horrendous a horrendous thing that had happened and it's 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 playing into that you know like i mentioned earlier that genocidal tag that's been attached to the u.s government's relationship with native americans and certain countries i think turkey even though you know turkey have got a bit of a 
you know, take what they say with a pinch of salt. Um, they they even threaten to acknowledge that relationship as, you know, genocide. So it's really quite interesting to see these kind of things play out. And what you know, what was obviously Weldon was very protective of her her Native Americans. Do we know her reaction to Wounded Knee and the death of Sitting Bull? We don't. Like there, there are no written records. Like I assume that she was heartbroken. Like, like to have lost her son and like one of her friends like that close together. And like it just, I assume she was heartbroken. But there is no written record. That, so, so obviously, it's been characterized as, as genocidal. Is there any other like? major events that stand out to you and you feel that people should be aware of that happened or occurred towards uh, these Native American tribes because obviously it's 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 good to educate people about these um, because it's it's an untouched part of history so are there any major events that you feel people should be aware of um I feel like there were several like other horrendous acts that were committed against the Native Americans in the United States. So I'm just going to suggest that um, the listeners um, pick up a book on Native American history and maybe just like read through it. Cause I, I mean, I have a, a small book over here, like Paul, like, I'm just going to grab it real quick. Yeah, it's fine. You have like Farewell My Nation, American Indians in the United States in the 19th century. Like this is a, a by Philip Weeks. This is a, a good book that if you just want to get like a basic um, history of what happened to the Native Americans in the United States, I would just recommend picking up just a Native American history book. And then you have also like, um, you can read the books written from the Anglo point of view. Yeah. But then I also suggest finding um, books written by indigenous historians like Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz, like an an, an and Indigenous People's History of the United States is an excellent book. So Okay, brilliant. Now, Caroline, I was about to call her Caitlin again. <laughs> Caroline returns to the East Coast. She's, she's witnessed this system and she's not been successful. Mm -hmm. uh, what happens to her? So she, she lives out, like, I guess the rest of her life on the East Coast, like, I think there was a record of her in New Jersey for a couple years when she was an, old, an older lady, but then she moves back to New York, which it's all kind of all up there really close. Yeah. So um, she lives in the, that apartment in the same kind of neighborhood she had been living in all along. And um, a house fire happens in her apartment, like a candle gets knocked over. Yeah and her dress catches on fire and she was an elderly lady at this point and could, i guess couldn't put out the fire she suffers second degree burns over a lot of her body oh. and she is taken to the hospital and she does not survive she uh, passes away and um that's the only other record we really have of her besides her dakota territory times because oh. like they say um they publish this in the newspaper and then they send it to the Dakotas as well to I guess alert her friends there oh, that's really that's a really sad ending for a woman who was so formidable and strong you know well-intentioned as you mentioned earlier but you know it's a very sad ending now but she wasn't the only woman was she no so you've mentioned Lucy B Arnold already mm -hmm. who was she who what, what was she doing she was also a member of NIDA. Um, she was, um, she translated between the Crook Commission and the Sioux Chiefs. There was like I think 20 Sioux Chiefs she translated between and was instrumental there. And she taught at the Black Pipe Day School on the Rosebud Reservation. And that's really all we really kind of know about her. Like I really wanted to like flesh out her story in my thesis, but that's another one of those I wanted to go to the archive on spring break of last year, but the literally like the Sunday before spring break at my university, 
uh, is kind of when the world shut down. So like I wasn't able to go to the archive and see and learn her story, but I know there's an archive with some papers that I eventually would like to get my hands on. That's another book for another day then. Exactly. (laughs) I'm looking forward to reading that one when you manage to flesh that one out as well then. And then there's also Mary Collins. So yes. Who is, who is this Mary Collins? So Mary Collins actually got to Standing Rock and Dakota Territory before Weldon did. But she's also living on the Grand River with Sitting Bull. She actually went up there and built a house without asking for permission. So she's living out there. And she's a Congregationalist missionary at this point. And Weldon and Collins are actually in Dakota Territory at the same time. And they're, they're both Anglo women. And I would call Collins a religious missionary. And then um, Weldon, I would call her more of an activist, but also kind of along with the, the missionary lines. But these women never mention each other in their writings. And I have my speculations as to why, because like uh, Collins is in one organization and you know Weldon is the other, in the other. And the organizations they are a part of um, have conflicting relations. So I think there was maybe some beef there and the women just never like interacted with each okay. other. But yeah, Collins was, she was just a congreg- she was a congreg- congregationalist missionary in Dakota territory. Oh, amazing. And you know, that's, that's really interesting. These, these three women were all working there, uh, but working differently to the same end. Um, now, ultimately you know if you have to ask the question were were they successful successful in what their the, the women were were they successful in their goals would you would you characterize that in that way or would you want to look at it a different way so i don't i, so I, w- I want to say like their goals were assimilation and eradication yeah so no they weren't excess they no they were not successful because the indigenous cultures in Dakota territory or so North Dakota and South Dakota now are very much still thriving still there and many of these reservations are still actually up there so so yeah it's it's never black and white is it but it's quite interesting to see that even now they were not successful despite the hard amount of pushing they were doing for it to to push through and then you know fast forward today you know, you're a Midwestern historian. You're very successful. You've got a fantastic thesis. Thank but you. <laughs> what is the United States relationship with Native Americans today? You know, do these do these events that happen back in the 1800s, 1900s, do they still affect that relationship between the U.S. government and Native American tribes? I would say that some of the relations are still very tense um, in certain cases. So, but I think to speak to just one case would be really hard because there are so many different tribes and nations within the United States that are still active. So, okay, brilliant. Well, I've I've really enjoyed this discussion today, Caitlin. Uh, I think this is great. Yeah, I, I think you know you're fantastic. You've been a fantastic guest on the podcast. Uh, I've learned so much from you. But as we always do on this podcast oh, i've recorded one it's something i want to do on this <laughs> podcast um i like to ask some fun questions to our guests um okay now i know you are just as i am you're a fan of country music and exercise you know you are yes <laughs> the active historian so firstly could you name three country music artists i know it's a bit difficult but three country music artists for people to go and listen to Okay, so three, only three. Okay, number one is going to have to be George Strait. Like, I love George Strait. I actually got to see him in concert last January before everything shut down. So, like, literally probably one of the top five days of my entire life was going to see George Strait. Um, that's a big, that's two, a big name. That's a big name for number one. Yeah. You've gone strong. Oh, it was great. Uh, Cody Johnson. I like Cody Johnson. I like Red Dirt and Texas country music. So um, 
I haven't got to see him live yet, but he's coming to Oklahoma in November. So maybe. It's <laughs> right on so. to buy those tickets. Yeah. Um, number three. I've seen on the notes that you've written three. <laughs> I, I know. I gave you like a list. Um, we'll say Parker McCollum. Okay. So he's kind of breaking onto the scene right now, getting really, really big. So. Well, I'll start listening to Parker McCollum then. Yes. But yeah, I'm I'm a big Morgan Wallen fan. I know he's he's okay, said yeah. he's done and said some stupid things. But, but he uh, got some good music. Yeah, he's got some fantastic music. So yeah, I definitely recommend all of them to our listeners. And then of course you are the active historian. So three pieces of exercise equipment that you cannot live without. I like dumbbells, bands, and a good pair of running shoes. There we go. And Caitlin is always showing off her dumbbells, her yoga mat, and some blocks yes. <laughs> on her story and her post. So I'd recommend recommend some of those equipments as well. I do love do love the dumbbells and exercising. So obviously this is an hour long podcast and that's that's not the limit of this history. That's not the limit of the Native American history or mm-hmm. the stories that we are talking about. So if anyone wants to read any more about this and learn more about this topic what would you what would you recommend that they'd go and read and look at okay so i actually don't have hard copies of these books i actually watched your video yesterday about tips for uni students oh. and how like you recommend them buying like hard copies of like the essential books but fortunately like my, my library and my topic like i was able to get the books i wanted anytime so i just rented a most of them so I'm just going to have to give you a list. So grab yep. your pen and paper and I will just have y'all write them and down. And all these links will be in the description be- uh, like below for the video as, as always with Amazon Perfect. links. So yeah. Jackson is on top of things. <laughs> so the book number one, I would, I'm going to recommend Eileen Polak's Woman Walking Ahead in Search of Catherine Weldon and Sitting Bull. This was actually the first book I actually read about Catherine Weldon after I watched the movie about her life called woman walking ahead. Oh, there's a little, there's a little, there's a little discrepancy there. I wanted to, so there she's mentioned as Catherine Weldon. Oh yes. So what's the difference there? So depending on the source depends on um, what they call her. So some newspaper articles call her Caroline. Some newspaper articles call her Catherine. So really it's just. Whichever one you want. Yeah, and like it makes more sense to me. Like I found more recurring um, uses of Caroline, so that's why I stuck with Caroline. And then also her Susanna Carolina face. So like, I think it, it was probably sense. just a, a mishearing when they called her Catherine. Okay. So that's kind of why there's a discrepancy of Catherine Caroline. So, book number two um, is going to be Glenda Riley's Women and Indians on the Frontier, eighteen twenty five to nineteen fifteen. So that's just kind of more of a book, more about like missionaries activists how different women were actually interacting with the indigenous women in the west and then number three we're going to zoom out bigger than just like um micro history of caroline and then like just like a, a regional uh, i guess a topic but we're going to go with sandra l myra's uh western women in the frontier experience 1800 to 1915 and like i know this book was published in the 80s but it's still like one of the seminal works in the field of women's history in the West. So I would recommend reading that one. I've cited that book in multiple papers. So brilliant. And of course, guys, if you, if you wanted to read it, uh, Caitlin's thesis is online. It is an absolutely amazing read. I couldn't recommend it more guys. So definitely go and have a look at that. And if people want to go and find your thesis and look through what you've written and your bibliography, where, where do they need to go, Caitlin? So I think you can probably type in, like um, you can either try to like Google search it or like you can just go to my website, which is theactivehistorian.com and click on my portfolio tab. And it's literally the first link at the top. Oh, so like, that would probably be the easiest way to find it. Yeah, and uh, I will make these links available in the descriptions okay. as well, just so it's a little bit easier for people <laughs> yeah. as well. I know there's a lot of books going on right here as well. Um, and then if people want to find you, keep up to date with you, and ask you questions as well about this. Where, 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 where do they need to go? So again, like my, my website is kind of the hub of everything. So like theactivehistorian.com. And then I'm also on like 
most like I would say all of the social media um, platforms, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, YouTube. So uh, just like the active historian on most of the platforms. But at the top of my website, underneath my name, there are little circles that have links to all these. So just click on the circle and it'll take you to whatever platform you want to go to. Brilliant. I do recommend following following Caitlin and all those uh, those profiles. She is very, very active on social media. <laughs> more active than i am so that's that's something and her youtube videos are fantastic so do check them oh, out guys you. so that has been caitlin and this has been history of jackson thank you very much for listening guys uh, i hope you enjoy it and we'll see you next time